Okay. Well, I, I'll, just, I'll, just, I'll just say this is Laws um, 12059 Conveyancing, and we're doing Topic 7, the subject matter of sale. And, uh, you know, basically, um, we're, what we're considering in this course is, you know, those aspects of the contract of sale um, that are critical in the process. Um, we're looking at matters that include how the subject matter is identified, how the parties are identified, whether there's issues between the documents, the contract, the, um, uh, the version of the indefeasible title, as we can refer to it uh, now in, uh, in the Queensland context, um, issues about improvements on land, um, regulatory compliance, um, notification of encumbrances, etc., on uh, title documents and whether they are equally reflected in the contract of sale, um, whether we're looking at or what version of contract of sale we're looking at, whether it's residential, that is houses and land, as it's known in Queensland, or the commercial contract, or a contract with regard to um, high density developments uh, under the um, BCCM Act. Um, we've had a look at that previously, so we're not focusing overly on that just at the moment. Um, the Land Title Act uh, is relevant. The Torrens Act, of course, has continuing relevance. The Property Law Act continues to um, be relevant uh, in, in this uh, area. And um, it's important also to see that there are other, other documents that are part of this. The survey, the plan of survey, a critical document which reveals information um, about the, the boundaries of the property. It reveals information about the location of uh, improvements on the land. Um, it will also note diagrammatically uh, easements, uh, covenants and so on which are referred to in this topic um, as potentially affecting uh, land title. And of course, you can see immediately the overlap here with um, uh, the topics that are covered in Laws 12066 Land Law. And um, at the moment, um, students that are doing this course can do this concurrently with Land Law. Um, I think possibly going forward, uh, that may well become a prerequisite course for this course rather than a co-requisite course, but at the moment it's co. So. Um, all of, all of you that are doing the course I know are doing land law with me as well. But you can see the overlaps there between uh, these um, two, this, this topic in particular and, um, and land law. Um, Grant, did you have any, uh, thing that you, any comments or thoughts before we proceed into the um, problem questions? Um, only one comment, just yeah. with um, making land law a prerequisite to this course. Hmm. I've actually found it, I've enjoyed doing the, the overlap. I've enjoyed the overlap. Yeah. I, th I find that there's positive reinforcement between both of them. Mm. Mm. Um, and I've, I have enjoyed doing the two courses concurrently. I've actually, that would be my preference. So that's interesting. That's interesting because, um, that's, thanks for that, because, you know, we, I'm, we're giving thought to um, the issue about the, um, you know, requisite co and pre but we're also giving thought to making uh, uh, conveyancing a third year elective rather than a second year elective. Um, mm. But you're, 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 um, you're reflecting the, the benefit of doing them together at the same time. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. 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 Okay, well, that's, that's good. Thanks for that. Um, all right, so um, let's get stuck into these tutorial problems. Um, now, do you want to you do you want to start? I'm seeing Tony, you here. <laughs> yeah. um, do you want to, do you want to start with the one that you posted a response to? <laughs> well, that's that's the one that I've certainly looked at in more detail. Not <laughs> really given a lot of attention to. Yeah. Uh, so, well, I'll just but, say for the purpose of the recording, um, that's problem yeah. fourteen. Um, we'll come back to problem thirteen in a moment, but that's problem. We'll start with problem fourteen as as you you have posted a response to that, and I've. Um, giving you some feedback on that. So, um, just um, okay. Let's let's have a look at problem fourteen, Grant, and, and uh, just you know walk 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 me through that and and how you'd like to have a look at it. 
Right. Um, obviously, this is a this is regarding a residential purchase or a potential residential purpose. Mm. Uh, on as a solicitor taking the first review of a contract of sale, which I've presumed they haven't entered into the contract of sale. They've been given a copy of it to examine, to look at, to um, to seek guidance on. No, that's correct. And that's a correct interpretation, yes. And that's an important um, point to note because you need to know at what point in the process you're speaking to uh, the client, both from, you know, a practice perspective so that, you know, very important, you know, if you're having a first meeting or a first engagement with the client, um, that you need professionally to make a good impression and you need to make sure you cover what's important at that first initial meeting. Um, and that, you know, th that would entail some, some, you know, basic what I might call housekeeping matters and procedural matters, not just legal or legality type issues. Um, and you have, to, uh, you have to know, and it'll be evident to you as soon as you see the documentation, uh, if you've got documentation, whether this is a situation where the clients have already entered into a contract or whether this is a contract that they've got from the agent or has been sent to you from the agent uh, and, um, you, you know, you, you're being asked to advise as to whether this is something prudent to do. And remember, of course, and this is not tossed up in really in the facts directly, but there's always, if, if you're in that scenario of no, we don't yet have an enforceable contract, then the first one of the first things you have to talk to your clients about, to the sweep, as it were, uh, is the cooling off period. Um, and uh, that, um, you know, that you've got that, that's there uh, under the under legislation and um, uh, certainly, you know, generally the advice would be that you clients should take the benefit of that um, and uh, they have that, that period of grace, if you like, five days, um, to decide whether they wish to proceed um, and enter into a legally enforceable contract because once both sides have signed the contract, that's what we have and lots of things s jump up into action stations, if you like, once we have uh, a signed ex and executed contract by, by vendor and purchaser, we then have immediately the consequence of contractual obligations and responsibilities. So that's right. You've correctly identified that. Just the other, just one little thing that you you might have. Um, I just want to bring get your response to is that it's correct to say we've got a residential house, and so therefore, what's the version of the standard contract of sale we're looking at? Uh, I can't think of the title. <laughs> Housen, houses and land. Okay, so in in Queensland, unlike in New South Wales. In, and, and, uh, and other jurisdictions. In Queensland, there are three versions of the standard contract of sale from the REIQ, and where it's a residential purchase of a, of a, of a freestanding dwelling, which this appears to be in problem 14, and it's a houses and land contract. But um, does it make a difference where, where this, where this uh, proposed purchase is? Because the facts indicate something, don't they? In terms of location, the yep. um, regional, rural location of the property. Does that make a difference? Uh, not as far as I can. I, I certainly don't believe so. It's going to be within the jurisdiction of Queensland. Or That's Purdue. fine. That's fine. But if you think even in your own situation of where you're located, for instance, uh, in, in regional New South Wales, I think, um, would, would it make a difference if you were advising a client, for example, on purchasing, purchasing a residential property, say, in metropolitan Sydney or in metropolitan Brisbane, um, as opposed to in a regional town? Would that make a difference? Potentially the type of property, if it's a high-rise apartment versus a, a farm on a few thousand acres or even just a residential plot. Well, um, we, we know this is a residential house, yeah. Because the facts reveal that. So we know it's not a farm. We know it's not an agricultural holding. We, we know it's not a high-rise development. So we know, you know, contractually what, what contract applies. But the point I'm really getting to is that, of course, there is a difference in terms of um, just practical matters, okay? So the sort of issues that might present practically for the purchaser of um, a dwelling within the metropolitan 
capital city will not necessarily be and will probably not be identical to the sort of issues that will present to a person in uh, regional location. The other thing which doesn't really come up, uh, you know, in the course, um, but, uh, and it's certainly not, uh, not directly tossed up by the facts, but um, one of the, the things that started to occur a bit is, you know, people, governments are trying to encourage people to purchase dwellings in regional, regional centres, and sometimes there are financial incentives to do that. Certainly, for example, uh, the New South Wales government is providing financial incentives to purchasers to move to um, regional locations, and I think Queensland has also um, undertaken that. So what I'm saying is that as a practitioner, as a, as a, as a, um, a solicitor advising a purchaser, there is a range of matters that, that you need to have an awareness of uh, in addition to what's actually on the contract and, and uh, the legalities. Um, and uh, you need to have your eyes open about the totality of the facts. You know, that's, that's uh, what's going on here. All right, that's fine. Just um, keep, keep taking us forward. Yep. Um, so on the facts, uh, these two people appear to be purchasing a residential property or in need of renovation. Um, so again, I guess this takes it from the legalistic view to engaging a little bit with the um, with the client in terms of what their intentions are, the type of property they're buying, what it's for, what they intend to do. Yep. Um, and certainly at that initial consultation where it's not a signed contract, um, that would obviously be the time to establish those things. Mm. Um, and um, on review of the documents, there is uh, there are two sheds yep. and there are garage where there is uh, some evidence that there is a main drain running underneath the garage yep. Yep. Uh, and so these are the and then there is the subsequent contact from the vendor's solicitor advising that the sheds uh, since that contract was released that the sheds had burnt down mm. uh, you so you told something else about the sheds a bit earlier in the information that they're not lockable. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that may somehow link to that later bit of information, of course. And, you know, when, when one concocts a scenario like this, you know, from my side of the table, right, which is what, one of the things I do, of course, I try to create things that are as realistic as possible, right? But one of the things that, and this is, you know, um, as, as a future practitioner or legal advisor, you need to know what questions you need to ask your client because the client doesn't just come in and volubly tell you everything, okay? The client will often sit there and expect you to lead the charge in a sense and we'll tell you some things and if there are documents, good and well, and you can, you can scrutinise the documents and you can proceed asking questions based on the documents. But this is, you know, to some degree, this is an experience thing. And, um, you know, that's why, you know, some practical legal experience, which is something that you're also required to do before you go out there and practice, is important. But it's um, knowing what questions to ask and knowing, I mean, you mentioned earlier, which was good, the, the idea of, well, what are the, what are the, what do my clients, what are they, what are they thinking or planning to do, in, to do with this property? And then if you know, for example, that, for instance, they're purchasing the property to knock down everything that's on it and build something else then that's something that you can build into the questions you ask, the information you gather to better fully inform your clients in terms of what they wish to achieve, all right? And, of course, the scenario, as I've put it together here, tries to toss up various bits and pieces and, and aspects and whatever. Um, but this is, you know, I think this course uh, particularly, but I... I actually firmly believe that every law course you do should have this skills component embedded in it in some way, um, is this idea of knowing what you need to ask about. It's a bit like knowing what you need to know, which is, <laughs> sounds almost tautological. But, um, and that's challenging, actually. And it's an, as I said, it's partly an experience thing, but it's also, you know, it's an intuitive thing. So you know, the client will tell you certain things and you will then, that should twig, you know, reactions in you about what more to ask. 
you know, it's a bit like, you know, if I can give a, another sort of left field example, it's a bit like an advocate in a court proceeding, you know, um, ad, you know in, in advocacy training, advocacy courses and whatever, people that are being prepared to be advocates in, in whatever capacity, it's all, I remember when I, when I studied, you know, first um, in law school many years ago, the um, professor that um, taught me, um, or the the, the um, academic who was also a practicing barrister, um, and he taught me you know, criminal advocacy. And he, one of the things that he kept reiterating was, "You never ask a question that you don't know the answer to in a in an advocacy court scenario." You know, because you don't want to be surprised in front of everyone that's you know, and then and then have that in that formal process. In this situation, in a transactional situation, as opposed to that scenario in advocacy, in a transactional situation, you you haven't, I mean, you're not being governed by rules of evidence and all this sort of thing, but you, you do need to ask questions to elicit information to get the full picture. So you know what's going on, you know what your clients are wanting to do or intending to do. Um, Again, as you mentioned earlier, um, not today, but I think in another class, <laughs> ethics is never too far, you know, away from this. And, of course, you can sometimes um, get information that maybe you don't necessarily want in terms of what the client's proposing to do. But um, just in, in, in terms of, you know, what this is trying to achieve, you do need to inform yourself as fully as you can so you can advise your clients in the best way you can. So, okay. so for from a conveyances point of view, yeah. um, and I nearly touched on this subject in my response, but then I decided not to because I thought it was it was taking it a bit too far. Mm. However, knowing that the um, the clients in this case have a fairly clear intention that they will probably knock down those sheds. Mm. And, however, the vendor would not be aware of that or most likely would not be aware. Mm. The fact that it has burnt down, um, and that may even be a benefit to the purchaser. However, that's also a commercial opportunity to go back to the vendor and say, well, in light of this incident where this has burnt down, mm. I would like to sort of, you know, push down the price and negotiate a bit harder on the price. Is that type of commercial advice, which is sort of apparent on the facts, but probably not the obligation of the conveyancer, is that something that the conveyancer should be discussing with the client? Firstly, talk... I prefer you to talk more about yourself being a practitioner or legal um, a practitioner or solicitor than a conveyancer. Sorry, I, I actually mean... <laughs> I, 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 understand, I do. I fully understand how you mean it. And I know that even some practitioners continue to, you know, on, on the shingle they hang outside, continue to, to, to use this phrase, con solicitors and conveyancers and proctors and whatever, and I... I think it's all a bit nonsensical myself because in New South Wales, for example, and in other jurisdictions, um, there are such things as conveyances who are regulated and go through a course of training who are not solicitors and are not legally qualified. And when you come up against them in transactions, you will certainly be aware that you're dealing with a conveyancer rather than a solicitor. Um, even though most of the time, most of the transaction is handled to a large degree by, you know, by historically by not by solicitors but the solicitor has the carriage of the matter and is responsible ultimately for the matter but um, so that's just one little point but um, look I mean that's a good point to bring up and I think that client you know this there's a couple of point a couple of aspects here one is um, do you go back to your client first and raise this as a possibility do you try and suss out the position from the other side through your colleague who's representing the vendor. Uh, ultimately, the decision on bargaining is not for you, that's for the client. But there's nothing to stop you, you know, at suggesting to the client that this could be a possibility and that might be something uh, during the cooling off period before we have a binding contract for... Um, the, the, the client possibly to see if there is any leeway here, given the fact that we actually have a changed situation. So the, given the fact that 
you know, and this I've deliberately done this, right? We've got a chain situation in that we've lost the sheds, okay? And the vendor knows the sheds in our cactus, basically. And assumedly the price, the purchase price was on the basis of sheds there, whether they needed to be renovated or whatever, but they were there and they, you know, they probably you know, could have been used in whatever form. And the fact that they're now gone and the fact that the, the vendor solicitor has said, well, are, the, are you, you know, are, is your client still interested? Of course, one of the responses could be, well, my client could still be interested, but is there any, any leeway here on, on price or purchase price? One would need to seek instructions first with regard to that. Um, and that could be a matter for the client to proceed on and probably best for them to do in terms of thinking about that. Um, but yes, that's an aspect, but it has to be carefully managed because you're, you know, it's not for you to make that decision in terms of the commercial decision, but if you can get a, a better deal for your client within what's legally permissible, your client will be very appreciative. Sure. And um, that's what they'll be, you know, the, and, and if you, you know, if you don't, then, then they'll be disappointed as well. You know, clients can very easily be disappointed, by the way. <laughs> Particularly new clients, you know. Yeah. Um, this is this, this is a garnering of trust. Okay, so, so uh, one, of, one of the things I want to say to you, <clears throat> just in terms of thinking about particularly say, you know, generally going forward, but also in terms of the remainder of the assessments in the course. Um, yes, there, you know, if you can see something, a, a commercial perspective there, having dealt with the law and having dealt with the legal issues, if you can see a commercial aspect that you think needs to be um, responded to as well, by all means, within, within limits and within what you regard as appropriate in the circumstances, so long as you are doing it in such a way as where you are um, suggesting that you're always going to be acting on the basis of instructions. Sure. Yeah. Good. Uh, let's keep rocking and rolling, eh? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I think uh, we covered that uh, on review of the documents that um, it was apparent that there was a drain under the garage. Um, now, there doesn't appear to be an easement per se. That's However, the garage, not the sheds, is that right? That's the garage. We're now talking about the garage. Yeah, 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 sure. Um, so that's a, an initial alarm bell is that... Um, what sort of drain is it? Well, it's saying a mains drain, which oh. interpretation that is either going to be a sewerage drain, a, a main sewer, or perhaps a main storm drain. That's right. right. Very good, very good. And, and so, again... This is testing your your careful rendering of the information, your careful scrutinisation of the information that's been presented to you by the clients so that, you know, a mains drain means exactly as you've described that one would, one would expect. Nor, I mean, ordinarily you'd expect to see a drainage diagram as part of the contract information and that would reveal such things. Um, but... Um, the, the mains drain description suggests a substantial drain here, um, probably by the relevant water service. Um, and that raises a whole lot of issues that, that are not just about, you know, your drain connecting to the, 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 the central system, as it were. Um, now, you started talking about easement, an easement. Yeah, you want to go on a bit more about that? The, it's not clear on the facts whether um, an easement whether an easement exists, um, and again, uh, operating on the basis that the seller has provided these documents, whether doing a full um, title search will reveal uh, that an easement does exist, uh, that would be done, I guess, in the next stage once the contract is signed, even if it's signed conditionally. Now, um, just a little bit more on, on the easement. I know this, uh, it's interesting when talking about easements. I mean, the... the, the you, uh, fact that we're doing land law at the same time and the easements topic is there uh, open but it's a little bit a little bit further down the track than, than this topic in, in conveyancing um, but we can get easements on the uh, indefeasible title document can't we correct 
yeah. So the when it when so when we have the easement as a, a registered interest in that way, what is it? What is it saying about the easement? It's saying that um, you can't escape, or you you certainly have to. You're legally obliged to abide by that if it's on if it's being registered. It becomes part of the indefeasible title, but it affects. What is it affecting? Usage of the land. It affects the land. It, it's attached to the land, isn't it? So that yeah. if the land is transferred, then then that interest represented through the easement, which is on the indefeasible title, also is transferred. In other words, what I'm the the point I'm trying to get to here is unlike, for example, something that we'll see after easement, something called, you know, covenants, a freehold covenant, it is not just a personal obligation between parties to a transaction, but it is actually something that attaches to the land, right? And uh, where it's been registered, it's on the, on the indefeasible title, there it is. And it affects the land going forward. But uh, on, on this, on the fact, sorry, sorry. On on the facts that are provided here, though, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it doesn't show on the limited facts that there is an easement mm, um, mm. or a register. But it does show on the certificate of title reference to the main drain. Exactly. Um, exactly. And, so this, and so that is an alarm bell. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's so an that, alarm bell. And and so. Sorry, you, you go, you go. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, that, that raises the prospect of further investigations required to ascertain is there an a easement? Yeah. Um, and if there is not an easement, well, then, and this is where in my response, I then looked at the, um, the local government statutory provision mm. that mm. on the surface to me carries the same effect as an easement, that you still are obliged to provide access yeah. Um, and the statutory body is entitled to protect that drone. Yeah, yeah. What, uh, now that's, you know, can I just, that, that's good, by the way. Can I just twist it around a little bit? And um, I don't know if there's going to be necessarily an answer to this, but where we're operating today within a sphere of government control where uh, there are aspects of government service that have been contracted out to the private sector. And utilities, for example, various utilities have been, have been corporatised or privatised. Does that have any impact in terms of the interest of the party that's asserting the right with respect to access and therefore, for example, the protection through an easement, for instance, with regard in this case to access to, 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 to a drainage pipe. And of course, the whole purpose of the easement is to give access for the purposes of maintenance, repair, so on and so forth, right? And that right can override the private owner's rights with respect to the property itself. If this is a main drain, for example, and it bursts and it's, you know, causing, you know, problems with the system, the, 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 the water, the utility provider needs to get access and it doesn't matter whether this is on private land and, and repair it or deal with it or whatever. And if you've got to dig up the land and the, and the drain is under a garage, guess what they're going to be digging up? Exactly. Yeah, right. <laughs> Jackhammers and it's and so on. Very messy. Very messy. Now my question is, and that's a big, that's another big issue, and there's something that you may need to advise the client on, right? That issue, practical implications of that. But my question goes to what if the utility provider is a private enterprise following this contract con, contractualization of government services? Does that have any does that make any difference in terms of the sort of way that that utility provider seeks to assert its right with regard to things like a mains drain? Uh, short answer is no. And I say that um, fairly confidently, although I can't 
site off the top of my head, but so I do what recall I'm when I was um, if, when I the provisions of the Local Government Act that you've cited would they still apply? If um, this goes straight to constitutional law, and again without citing the provisions because I can't remember it, but when I study constitutional law, um, private uh, bodies acting contracted by the government or on behalf of the government, authorised by the government, uh, are in effect to the private person at the other end, you are dealing with the government body. Um, so I don't think that would have any practical significance that what, whether it's a private if, contractor, if they are authorised by the statutory body, then I don't see how that has any practical significance at all. So under a contracting out scenario, that may well be so. But what if, which is something that's happening in some jurisdictions, the utility has actually been sold off to a private enterprise and is no longer part of government function? What then? So, for example, for example, we're talking here about easements with respect to drains, okay? But we can also have easements with respect to... Um, you know, electricity power lines and, and things like that as well, okay? Um, now, in New South Wales and in other states as well, um, there are moves afoot, not finalised, to sell off not only the utility service but the actual hardware itself so that it will be privately owned. Well, that, that, implies, that implies selling the title to the easement, does it not? But what if there is no easement that's been registered? Then that's the power of the, of the legislator to, to basically pass law to encumber the, that easement and to pass title on it. But my, do question that is, my question is that does that provider then get the benefit and the protection of the local government legislation in that scenario? Yeah. I would think, uh, unless it was legislative, legislatively provided for, mm. and that protection was uh, was extended to them mm. clearly in the legislation, then if the if the lines or the land that the lines are on, or the land, the easements that the sewers or the drains are in, if title to those easements is transferred to a private entity. Mm. a private corp uh, corporation, mm. then they, to me, become a private holder of that easement. Mm. So unless yeah. there is something to say that they have special rights or privileges, mm. then See, would they one, not have entitlement to it? One of the problems we're getting into here, and this is not, I don't think this is factored in the debate at all at this stage in terms of the privatisation of utility services, um, you know, it's been seen, for example, from an economic perspective as a great potential gold mine for funding for state governments who are impoverished because they can't raise funds by too many other means. But one of the implications here is that the, re the rationale behind, um, you know, you've correctly cited, you know, provisions, for example, potentially from local government legislation in addition to where the easement, um, if the easement is registered on the certificate of title or the indefeasible title. But one of the, the issues that's been historically um, at play here is the intersection between the private landowner and government, and government having a broader interest and a broader concern than the private landowner. So, for example, the whole purpose of the easement in this context, for example, is to allow to give access to the, the mains drain, for instance, if that's what we're talking about, which is relevant on the facts here, because the mains drain is important and relevant not just for this private landowner on whose property it passes under, but for, for other members of the community to which the government has an obligation. But when we privatise the service, and I don't mean just corporatise it, but when we sell it, actually physically sell it off, and then it's a private entity that actually has responsibility of that. There's a sense in which the equation's been changed because now we've got two private entities competing against each other. We've got the private entity that now, as a business, is providing this utility service and we've got the private landowner. Now, there obviously, some accommodation has to be struck here through the way in which some changes might be affected to the law or whatever, but it's just interesting to think about how that might change the balance of this equation.
Mm. All right. Um, so we don't have the easement noted on the certificate of title, which means that we don't have a registered easement with regard to the mains drain. Uh, you've referred to potentially local government legislation that may still maintain a right of access for the utility provider. Um, what's next? Um, what's next? The potential conflict between a statutory body with a right to that drain and the fact that there has been a garage built over the top of it. Mm. Um, that would be avenue for further inquiry to see if there was planning approval for the garage. Mm. Um, on the facts, I think it was a self-standing garage, if I recall correctly. Yep. Um, and so whether that was built at a later time or with or without council approval, that may have an implication. But the question um, is, from a practical point of view, what are you going to, how are you going to advise your clients on this? You've got, you know, you've got a drain, a mains drain sitting underneath the garage. Right now, the sheds are a different issue, and they're burnt down anyway. And we'll do, you know, that they're they're done and dusted basically. Um, but the garage, you know, is 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 a valuable aspect of the improvements for for particularly a residential uh, dwelling. And remember, this is a regional town, so main main form of main form of transportation is what. Motor car. Exactly. It's not trams and light rail running down the, <laughs> the main streets of regional centres, mostly in Australia. Um, and most people like to garage their motor vehicle. They don't like, you know, sitting out in the open. So this may be a real issue that the clients aren't fully across and that you may need to, you know, bring to their attention that, look, you know, you've got a, your garage is sitting on a mains drain here and there's prospect going forward of the utility provider wanting access to that and they may actually have to come in and dig up the floor of the garage to get access. Yeah. Big problem. <laughs> so that, this is another issue about, you're correct in pointing out the legalities about council approval and these sorts of things, which, you know, you, that, that can go back to the vendor in terms of disclosure and, and those sorts of things. But there's also the practical aspects of you know, well, is, is it prudent for the client to proceed in this uh, purchase given, given this, this understanding? Um, okay, good. That's great. Uh, move on. Yep. What's next? Um, and so if we're moving on to the sheds, the, the sheds that were destroyed, um, the fact that which we touched on earlier, that may even be an advantage to them in the sense that they were looking at demolishing the sheds anyway. Yep. Um, so that may not be a sort of concern to them. Yep. Um, however, if they did decide that they wanted to retain or maintain those sheds, then there is no, without those sheds being detailed, there is no obligation on the vendor to rebuild those sheds or provide for them otherwise. So that would be a risk that they would be accepting unless they put a provision into the into the contract or negotiate it otherwise, whether that's for yeah. a reduced price or for them to be reconstructed or something of the sort. Yeah. Um, do you need, do you need if, to bring up do you need to bring up the insurance issue with the client? Absolutely. And that was the key point mm. was that it raised the issue of insurance because mm. Upon signing the contract, the vendor is not liable um, to either maintain existing insurance or take out insurance on, on the property yeah. waiting for the contract to complete. So, therefore, the advice to the client needs to be that uh, on signing the contract, you need to have or take the risk, but you need to have your own insurance on the property. From signing the contract. They're very important. Absolutely important. That I'm signing the what about the fact that, so don't worry about the fact that the sheds, I mean, the sheds are gone. They've been destroyed, right? There's two other features, two other bits here. One is that you're told the reason for the destruction. Now, does that raise any, any regulatory point or? Uh, it does, although I would have thought, I touched on this, but mm. I would have thought that the real time to address this, other than giving them an advice that it, mm. it may require investigation, mm. um, getting a, someone who's qualified, 
uh, to you know to assure themselves that there's not you know further risk. Mm. Um, I would have thought that would be done as part of the building inspection yep. and as part of the title search, be checking whether it had the compliance with yep. Yep. Um, smoke detectors, uh, safety switches, yep. you know, all those sort yep. of things. Yep. Um, I would have thought that would come in the second stage after yep. signing the contract. Okay, but you can explain it to the clients in the first uh, meeting, you know, that there are these other yeah. matters that we need to, to raise. Um, we may not even get them if you decide. Yep pull out of the purchase, right? Pulling out or not pulling out of the purchase, yeah. again, it'll be a balancing act for them. So if you can somehow find a way for them to go forward and get a better a better deal on the purchase in terms of purchase price, they may be prepared to accept some of these other problems, like, for example, the drain under the garage. Um, you know, because at the end of the day, you know, it comes down to what they want, where they want to live and how much they're prepared to pay. They're the practical matters that the clients are foc focusing on. The clients are not really focusing on all these legal aspects that you're trying to uh, bring to their attention or say are important. They're important from a legal point of view, but the client is really focused on these practicalities. Right? Now, the last bit is you, you, this information is passed to you by the vendor solicitor and then asks you a question. What response do you give to the vendor solicitor? That... I'm seeking advice from the client. Mm. I need, I need, I need further instructions. Okay. Yeah. So there's a little, little, little trap door there just at the end. Very easy. You know, I could have tossed in a little bit more. You know, that this was a solicitor you'd worked with before. Maybe it was an old uh, law school friend, whatever. You know, uh, which is not uncommon. Um, and, but you know, there's the ethical aspect again. All right, so that one needs to proceed in a proper way. One cannot make assumptions on behalf of one's client. One must always be acting on the basis of instructions, but that is knowledge that you've um, obtained or has been offered up, proffered to you by the vendor solicitor, and you can then go back to your clients and discuss this with them and then you know, you, you can explore various possibilities or, or um, path, paths that could be followed and then they need to make a decision about that and then they need to instruct you, you know. You know are they going to instruct you to go back to the vendor solicitor and say, well, you know, this is what I'm prepared, I'm prepared to make a, maybe a counter offer now on the, on the light of this new information or are they going to do it themselves and they're going to go through the agent or whatever? This is, now this is interesting too because this goes back to the agent again because the agent, of course, will be getting, it gets commission on sale if they're the effective cause of sale. If the purchase price is going down, their commission is going down. So <laughs> there's another third, third lever in the, in, the, in the mix here as well. <clears throat> so, um, but you're not acting for the, you know, the, the agent is not your client. But the purchasers are your client, and they're the, they're the individuals that you have to um, be directly concerned with. Just another practical issue <clears throat> is that, again, this doesn't get really, it's a bit of a left field issue, is that um, <clears throat> the names of the clients, is there anything I'm suggesting, or anything that the fact scenario suggests there that you might need to think a bit more about? In terms of <laughs> this is this is going into a whole another area, but well, no. It, it, what I'm really saying is that it, there is a in terms, there, of relationship, there is a, in terms of, sorry, in terms of their relationship as partners, whether that has an impact in terms of whether they're they're buying it as related as. Spousal partners as commercial partners. Yeah, yeah. That what that, I mean, they're, they're those issues, um, and also going back to the you know the topic we've just looked at in land law, uh, co-ownership. One of the things that you will need to explore pretty pretty promptly with them is if they are um, you know in a, it would you know, certainly would appear yeah. they're in a relationship based on the facts. I suspect um, then uh, are they buy in what capacity do they intend to purchase? That is as tenants in common or as joint tenants, and that aspect would need to be explained to them. 
Um, so you can see, this, as you mentioned before, there certainly is an overlap between these two, uh, um, the content of these two courses. Just the other point too is that um, given that they, you know, they, they, from their names, you would su suspect they're, they're coming from different cultural background. One of the issues there might be that there, there's a bit of an initiative by governments to, to get, um, you know, recent migrants, if that's their scenario, to settle in regional areas as opposed to in, in uh, metropolitan areas. And one of the further aspects of part of this transaction is that, you know, are there any government programs, government incentives that are part of making this process easier for them or um, whatever? Um, and that might be something that you need to just have a bit of a look at as well. I mean, that's not strictly, obviously, a conveyancing issue, um, but it's, again, an indicator that the totality of the scenario is something to, to be mindful of in terms of um, giving a, a full... A full um, advice to the clients in, in, in light of their particular situation. All right, that's, that's good. We're happy with that? Yep, happy with that. Good, excellent. All right, um, let's come back to problem 13. Now, it's a different situation in problem, have you had a look at problem 13? I've had a look that I have not attempted to answer. That's right. So we've got a different scenario here, um, and you can have a look at David's. Have you got, are you online? Oh, of course you're online. Yeah, um, <laughs> have you got have you got yeah, the course website? Right right yep. So you can go. I'm looking into, at David's response. Yeah, have a look at David's response, and then my feedback to his response on problem thirteen. So we've got a very different situation here, right? And and this is something that both for you, you know, just to, for yourself, but the benefit of others, and hear the recording. Where we've got a very different scenario, we've got to ask ourselves: All right, so how is this um, different to a residential purchase? We've now got a commercial situation, commercial building involving a shop and a residence above it. We've got. Um, uh, questions, uh, we've got a commercial contract, an RAIQ commercial contract as opposed to a houses and land contract. Um, we've got issues between the contract and the survey. Um, we've also got issues with regard to um, easement again, but this time easement for common carriageway. Uh, and we've then got um, the client uh, has has viewed the property. Now, one of the points you, if you've just had a look at my feedback to David's response, is that you know she says she's viewed it. Well, what does that actually mean? And now this is a real issue, I think, today because when people say they've viewed something, what are they going to mostly be referring to? Uh, they may be referring to a document to Google Earth, to an inspection from standing at the front of the property. But mostly, um, mostly, where will they have viewed the property if they're coming to it at an early stage in the transaction? Well, usually at an inspection, I would have thought. Well, sometimes. Well, that's, that, that, certainly that is, that is the case. I don't, I, unless you're talking about, obviously, most... Places these days are advertised online, so you may have looked online, seen photos, floor exactly. plans, different exactly. things. Exactly, that's the point. So with with e technology, so that's affecting our side of the table. It's also affecting the client side of the table, right? So you've got to clarify: Does their having viewed the property mean that they've actually gone and physically looked at it, or does it mean that they've only seen images online? Now. The problem we have with images online is they can be distortions, not necessarily accurate, okay? And even though they should be accurate, don't forget that if these are images that have been put up there by the seller or the vendor, like any seller or any vendor, they're trying to encourage you to buy the property. If the 
you know, if it's about trying to, uh, you know, reach out to potential purchasers. And again, commercial uh, scenarios will be different to residential scenarios, but that's an increasing issue, right? And um, the extent to which those images are actually being regulated in terms of what's required to be to be revealed about the property, I think there's, we haven't really got, I don't know how far we've gone in that direction because you see all sort of images and all sort of uh, perspectives on a property. What's interesting, of course, is what you don't often see is images about the fundamental aspects of the property. So you don't often see, for example, a photo posted online about a property, whether it's a commercial property or, or residential property, you know, of the, of the wiring in the ceiling. You don't often see a picture taken underneath the building of the plumbing and drainage. You don't often see um, a picture, uh, an online posting of the plan of survey. You are starting to see, for example, um, uh, documents looking at the, the actual floor spacing and so forth. But, you know, these other aspects are, are absolutely critical. You know, the way a building looks on the inside and the colour of the walls, and all, that's irrelevant. You know, purchasers are going to come in and they'll do their own thing. So why it's suggested or thought that that's relevant to a purchase baffles me, really. Um, so the idea about the view, you know, we need to clarify that. Um, is it an actual view? Is it an online view? Certainly, I, I would be saying to my, saying to my client that uh, it's great that you've had the view online. Get yourself out there and actually have a look if you haven't had a physical look. And that's in any type of a purchase, if, if, it's, if, if they're able to. I mean, your client may not be sitting around the corner from the, the, the property they're intending to purchase. And increasingly, again, with the technology online, your client might be sitting in another part of the country. They might be sitting overseas. So they might be an international purchaser seeking to um, invest. Right? Um, what about the current situation of the building? Um, I just wanted to touch on that view of the property um, yeah. where on the facts it says that the client has said that there seems to be a difference in the appearance um, compared to the diagram in the contract. Yep. Um, that in itself, whether she's viewed it online, yes, accepting your comment that she should get out there and have a look if she hasn't done so already. Yep. But, but now taking the next step that she has physically inspected the premises and there does appear to be that discrepancy. At that point, no doubt the advice would be to um, either get a, um, the vendor to provide an accurate um, plan of the building or to get an independent surveyor out there to measure it up and to, to go through the plans and substantiate it. That, of would course. that not... Or would that be a condition? Would that be a condition in the conveyance that then, when on signing the contract, that it is subject to all of that sort of coming up to a certain standard? Well, I mean, there's two points there, Grant, and that's what you've uh, what you've tossed up is is quite helpful. Um, the first point is that I think we need once we've clarified the nature of the view that's been had, we then need more clarification from the client about what is this difference that's being referred to. If you've got a copy of the plan of survey in front of you and you've got the client there saying that there's some difference here, well, what, what is the difference? Can you, can you explain to me what the difference is? You need, to, you need the client to be as specific as they can be about what they're talking about the difference is, right? It might be something in their head that they think is different, but in reality, it's not really all that different actually in truth. But if there is a, a, um, a tangible difference here, then yes, that is something that needs to be progressed. And if it is in the case that, for example, we, we you know, what we may well have is we have, an, it could be an old plan of survey that has not, and so the, the property hasn't been resurveyed since something has happened or whatever that's adjusted things on the, on the, on the, on the lot, then yes, absolutely the documents will need to be adjusted to accommodate that. We might need a new plan of survey. 
uh, as we'll see in the subsequent topic next week, we might need to have a um, special condition inserted into the contract that's agreed with the other side to deal with this matter. And then that takes us uh, into a different uh, role uh, as, a, as the solicitor or legal practitioner in the transaction where we start to get involved in negotiation with the, the solicitor for the other side. So this isn't a straightforward matter anymore. And I can tell you commercial matters are very often not straightforward because they've got turns and twists and wrinkles in them in various ways. Um, and uh, so negotiation with, with your colleague on the other side, that's one thing. So you know, we've got negotiation skills happening. Uh, and then secondly, drafting skills, we can no longer rely just on the standard form contract. We may need to draft special conditions into this contract. And there's our drafting skills coming to play. And that very, very important to remember at this point that m many law firms will have precedents online now. There are precedents that you can acquire or have access to in various ways with regard to things like, for instance, special conditions uh, in relation to a conveyance. Very important to remember that whilst these things exist, the solicitor or the legal practitioner must take responsibility for drafting up the condition if, there, if one is required and warranted to meet what the client wants and to meet the situation at hand. And that's the skill that you are actually being retained for, being remunerated for, and what your education provides you with the capability to do. And the sad reality is that many practitioners back away from that and all they do is they run, they run at about 100 miles an hour for a standard, uh, for, a, for a precedent which they can throw in, which often ill-fits, like an ill-fitting shoe. Or if it gets too complicated and involves too much law, they run off to a barrister and get some legal advice. Why on earth they think they need to get legal advice from a barrister when they're just as legally qualified as a barrister in respect of interpreting documents and being able to draft clauses and so forth? I have no idea. But the truth of the matter is that that's what happens in reality. So I just want to encourage everybody to, rem to remember that your legal education gives you that skill, training and capability to do that and that's actually what your client expects you to have the, the competence to do and the skill to do. So quite right, that may be what's, what's uh, necessary. Uh, what, uh, what next do we need to look at? Uh, on the facts, the solicitor has identified an issue in relation to an easement for a common carriageway. Um, which is separating it from other adjoining properties, although the facts don't actually say what that issue is. It just says there is an issue. So I'm not... So other than identifying and requesting further information... Mm. Um, so clearly what you've got here is you've got some... There's some problem with the easement and it needs to be further investigated. Yeah. Because, and the reason that's the case is because of the significance of the easement in affecting the indefeasible title, because it is a, an encumbrance on the title if it's a registered easement, okay? And so if there are problems with the way it's described and, and the nature of it, then that absolutely is something that needs to be um, further looked into. Just before we go a little bit further down to the last part, there's something that was mentioned right at the beginning, which I think we, we sort of, sort of sailed, sailed past. This is a commercial Occupied. building. Hmm? Occupied and rented out. Ah. So need, need to have a look at the leases. So, and again, <laughs> again we're, we're sort of, you know, piggybacking on land law. Um, and we're just about to, to look at leases. But we've got two types of... This commercial building has two... It's divided into two, um, two sets of premises, if you like. There's a shop and there's a residence above it. And we're, we're told that um, the, uh, both are currently occupied and rented out. Are we going to have different types of 
documentation and situations governing the shop as opposed to the residents? Most likely. What what might that most likely be? A little bit more. Well, <laughs> the type of lease on a shop, a commercial lease in terms of the restrictions on access, trading hours, usage, um, is typically going to be different from a, a residential lease, from a, a, a residential tenancies lease. Exactly. So what I'm getting at here, and again, a little bit sort of... Um, forward thinking, I suppose, we haven't covered leases formally yet, but um, the shop, now it says it's a shop, right? It doesn't say it's um, professional suite or office, whatever. The fact that it says it's a shop, most likely, most typically, it will be governed by a retail sales, be a retail sales lease. It, it could be a commercial lease. It'll be either of these, depending on on the situation, right? It'll be at the very least, it'll be a commercial lease, but it could also require some consideration of retail um, retail leasing retail leases legislation, um, which is in Queensland and also in other jurisdictions. The residence you would most typically expect, if it's separately um, occupied and rented out, will be subject to a residential tenancy agreement under residential tenancy legislation. So you've got two lease scenarios, but governed by different legal frameworks in relation to the occupation and the, the tenanting of these two um, dwellings, or two, two parts of the, the building. Your client is, 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 is in the situation of purchasing the building. So then the issue comes is, Purchasing with tenants in situ and continuing or with vacant possession. And it's certainly not uncommon for uh, purchasers to purchase with commercial uh, leases uh, that may be continuing um, and, and or residential tenants uh, under subject to agreement, but they may also wish to have either of those, particularly the residential tenancy agreement, um, uh, brought to an end and have that with vacant possession. But they are also issues that, that um, your client need, will need to think about. Um, is it fair to say then that at the start of this, as part of the initial discussion, is also a bit of fact-finding to work out what are they purchasing the building for? Are they purchasing it as an investment where they want to retain the existing tenants? Are they purchasing it because they want to occupy it? Uh, they want to use the shop facilities. They want to live in the residence above the shop. Um, What's mostly practically the situation? Well, I'm, I'm assuming a purchaser of a shop. A building, building. Is most a whole building, a right? building. Just buying the shop. Well, a, a, a commercial purchase where there is a, a shop and a residence mm. that the type of, well, this is a bit speculative, but uh, the type of person that would be purchasing is going to be an investor where they're not necessarily planning on using the facilities themselves. Absolutely, absolutely. People that own buildings which are used for commercial purposes and or residential occupation purposes almost to the person or to the entity, do not occupy the premises. They are basically purchasing them as a business venture or uh, as an investment, and then this building continues to function and to serve its purpose of having, you know, off offering commercial accommodation and residential accommodation to, to those interested in, in taking it up um, and then, you know, various the agreements have to be entered into to underpin that. So that's what's happening. So the very different scenario to the residential purchase where very typically in Australia, in all different parts of Australia but and in Queensland, where the residential purchaser very typically is seeking to be the owner-occupier. In a commercial scenario, that's not the case. But it may well be that um, the purchaser of a commercial building does want the building with vacant possession so that they can... You know, what's the reason for that? Because they might want to renovate the, the building 
and they might, and typically, of course, put the rent up, right? Um, and they might want to change the purpose of how the, the um, particularly the shop might be used, for instance. Um, so there's a whole lot of business and commercial issues there that arise that would need to be explored with the client in addition to the technicalities and the conveyancing aspects of the conveyance transaction. Um, just coming down to the last part of the scenario, is there any other, any other problems? The discrepancy in the spelling of the name, um, where the contract of sale has a different spelling to the person's name as to the certificate of title. Um, but but it's, it's only a minor discrepancy, isn't it? <laughs> uh, not, if, not if you're looking for an indefeasible title, it's not. <laughs> Now, this is the whole point, right? So that uh, we can talk about minor discrepancies, small inaccuracies, what and what, what, but the name of the person is pretty critical, okay? And, and yes, of course, I mean, I've deliberately just put an extra N in there, um, but that's pretty critical, right? So if, if the, the name on the contract is different to the name on the indefeasible title of the CT, then we've got an issue because it's not, Necessarily not the same person, not the same um, vendor. And so that needs to be rectified, okay? And we need to know that, um, and which is the one that takes priority? The registered certificate of title. Yeah, precisely, the indefeasible title or the CT. And um, <clears throat> so clearly what's happened is that it's just a typographical error, typo typographical error, I would suggest, with regard to the contract, but the prudent and careful practitioner needs to pick up on these things and uh, accordingly advise the client. The client will certainly appreciate that being uh, identified and that needs to be amended uh, with your colleague on the other side um, in, in a way that's legally uh, acceptable. Um, you know, and this is another indicator that um, even though, you know, a lot of these documents and so forth are managed and processed by non-legal staff, by admin staff, or historically that's been the case. With e-conveyancing, this may change a bit, I'm not sure, but um, by admin or by paralegals and whatever. Uh, you know, this attention to detail on legal documents is something that, as a lawyer, you, you must bring to bear all the time. Must bring to bear all the time. Attention to detail. And even small discrepancies like, you know, here we've got, you know, just a name, one letter of, of the name different. Where that name is, is found and the documents or the, the, the thing that we're looking at, where that difference is, is occurring may have critical impact in terms of um, the process. And in this case, of course, um, ultimately, the transfer of interest, the freehold in the in the in the building, in the, in the lot, uh, and the improvement on that that's the building, from the uh, vendor transferor to the purchaser transferee, and if there's a problem here with um, the name, then that can really be to some degree um, uh, cause some issues in that process that need to be clarified. Um, of course, in terms of indefeasible title. Um, it's just critical, of course, that the transferee's name is the correct person and, and uh, that is the person who will get the indefeasible title um, on registration of the transfer. Um, but the purposes of, of accuracy um, and consistency between the contract and the certificate, this is a matter that should really be addressed. Okay, that's problem 13. <clears throat> um, Anything else, Grant? Actually, that raises an interesting question. What if the certificate of title did have an error in the person's spelling of the name and that wasn't picked up by the registrar in the previous registration? Um, I mean, I do recall sort of reading that if the registrar makes a, an error and they're minor errors, that they can correct the registrar. Mm. Um, and that was more in relation to identifying factors re regarding the, the physical property. But what about if the, if the person's name was misspelt on the certificate of title and it seemed to get through the system 
sort of by mistake or unnoticed, how would, I, I presume the vendor would then have to go to the registrar to have it amended. How would they actually go about doing that? Well, the registrar has um, powers of, of amendment, um, but, uh, I mean, it's just, and there's, a, there's this careful um, scrutinisation <coughs> process that takes place to try and prevent these things from happening, but people, you know, human nature is, is as it is and it, it can, can occur. So there is a power for amendment um, by the registrar, but it's exercised you know, you know, um, very, very cautiously. Um, but the, the, the reality is, of course, that the, the name that appears on the indefeasible title is the name for, of, is the name of, is, is the name that's, that's registered as the um, registered proprietor of, of the lot. And, uh, you know, so it's, it can cause problems, yeah. Um, but there is, as I said, a power of of, um, uh, of correction in the registrar, but it's there's a process to go through, and then you've got to prove, the, you know, the issue about um, identity. If you know your name is not the same name as the name on the certificate of title or the indefeasible title, and uh, that you're actually the person that that your name should be the name that's on this title, and that becomes somewhat challenging. But um, yeah, it can be complicated. Yeah. Uh, all right. So, um, I'm just thinking, is there anything else we need to dealt with insurance? We've dealt with risk. We've dealt with. I think we've covered. Oh, wait, just look. One last thing that I might just um, advert to is um, if you go back to just page bottom of page eleven, and this is something particularly that's developed in Queensland, not in all jurisdictions, but. Um, the issue of administrative devices um, impacting upon um, the owner's ownership of the lot and their, their indefeasible, indefeasibility of title. Just at the bottom there, this is also identified as more, more interesting and more recent exceptions to indefeasibility in that part of the land law course. Um, just note uh, the significance of, um, you know, those, those recent acts the Petroleum and Gas Production and Safety Act, the Greenhouse Gas Storage Act, and the Geothermal Energy Act. And um, the, the point uh, that I just wanted to bring out about those, and this is if you have a look at page 294 to 295 of your textbook, is that under these acts we can have um, access agreements that are being entered into, um, but the access agreements may not necessarily be recorded on the indefeasible title. And so you, where you, you know, in terms of identifying the existence of these, uh, where you're acting for a purchaser, for example, can become a little bit more challenging. Um, and I, I note that on the bottom, the top of page 12, that, the, the, that those charges may or may not be noted as administrative devices on the title. Um, this tosses up really the bigger issue of, you know, the range of searches that are necessary. And increasingly, I suspect that what we really need here is almost a comprehensive um, cadastral system where the variety of, of um, aspects and features that can affect the quality of your title can be located through a, like a universal searching process. We don't have that at the moment. Um, and um, I probably we're, we're, a bit, we're a bit away from that, um, but that's what would be helpful. But given the fact that we don't have that, you just need to be on guard about the possibility or the prospects of this. And, and again, this goes back a little bit to, um, you know, where the property is located um, may, in, you know, suggest that, that these other things are, are alive or on foot that you might need to think about and, 
advise your clients with respect to and do some searching. Um, yeah, I mean, it's some, I mean, a, a recent example in Queensland, for instance, um, would be, for instance, not not specifically with respect to those matters, but I'm just thinking of of you know new new things and whatever. Like on the Gold Coast, for instance, um, we've recently had the construction of the new Gold Coast light rail system, and there will be easements that will have been put in place for the protection of the the facility of the utility of the light rail system. And that certainly would have happened post the acquisition of lots along the light rail corridor. And so that's something uh, interesting, I think, in terms of the impact on uh, lots that uh, are adjacent to that corridor and the impact that that might have going forward. Could be positive or and or negative, you know, um, but it's something that purchases of those lots would need to be mindful of. Just a, just a recent example. That's all. Um, okay. Anything else? No. All good. All good. Okay. All right. Well, um, that's uh, subject matter of sale. Um, so we'll um, we'll call it a day at that. And um, I'm hoping next week we might have two classes um, so we can get through two of these topics, um, which will be helpful, I think. <laughs> um, but I'll, I'll, send, I'll put up a, um, an email about that to, to everyone. Okay? All right. Thank Bye you very back. much. Bye for now. Bye. Bye. Bye.